week of Sabbath School. Welcome to all our participants and all of those who are joining with us from all over the world. We truly are blessed by each and every single one of you joining here at the Rennes and Adventist Church. We will be continuing our study on the wonderful book of Mark. And today's uh, lesson is titled, Week 8, Teaching Disciples, Part 2. Um, this week, we'll be continuing our study on how we can be better disciples for Jesus Christ, right? My name is Clifton Koipale, and I will be leading out in today's discussion. Um, I want to call it not a lesson, but a discussion, right? So what does that mean? I would like everyone to raise their hands, to give a comment, and ask a question, and to contribute to today's discussion. Amen. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Today's lesson is focused primarily on Mark chapter 10. Okay, with that being said, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, so much for this beautiful Sabbath day once more. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we can spend with you in Sabbath school where we can dive into your word and have a deep study of what your word says. We just want to ask for the Holy Spirit to be rained down and poured into the sanctuary to those online. Give us understanding, give us discernment, and give us humility as we dive into your word and help us to uh, draw out the sacred truths that are found in Mark chapter 10 that we may become better disciples for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 As mentioned before, Mark chapter 10 is a wonderful, is right behind Mark chapter 11. And in Mark chapter 11 is when Jesus and disciples enter that last week before his crucifixion. So Mark chapter 10 basically is teachings and stories that will, you know, help prepare us during our soon great trial. All right. With that being said, let's go ahead and move to Sunday's portion, which is titled, God's plan for marriage. So uh, this is found in Mark chapter 10, verse 1 to 12. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole section, but let's just, let's just figure out what's going on. So in verse 1, we see uh, Jesus in the coast of Judea, and then in verse 2, we see the Pharisees coming to him, and they have a question for him. They have a question for him. What do they tell Jesus? Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife. Now, was this a genuine question? What does the verse say? They said this to tempt him, right? They said this to tempt him, and then Jesus says, what did Moses command you, right? He points them directly back to the word of God. What a wonderful lesson for us, too. When people ask us a biblical question, we also need to be able to point them directly to the Bible, and then they respond in verse 4, well, Moses said that we're uh, allowed to write a bill of divor uh, divorcement to put her away. And Jesus, well, said this was not from the beginning. It is because of the hardness of your heart that he wrote this to you. And he points them back to creation and how the beginning there was male and female and how the two would become one flesh and then what, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Right? See, now going on the subject of marriage, you know, in those days, it was taught in Jewish schools that there was the conservative mindset and there was a the liberal mindset. And the conservatives taught that you weren't allowed to divorce your wife if she was not able to bear a child, if there was marital, uh, marital neglect, if there was emotional neglect. And uh, the other school, the liberal school, allowed divorce for literally any reason. Right? And now, why they, they knew this, and they asked this question to try to trap Jesus. You know, earlier on the subject of, uh, of divorce, we see that John the Baptist was beheaded for calling out Herod in marrying his brother's wife. So right now, they try to get Jesus to say something similar to trap him so that he can also be captured and killed as well. But that's why Jesus doesn't answer it in a way to get himself trapped, but he points them to the Bible. And we see his uh, response here in verse 4, how uh, uh, it is true that Moses did suffer a bill of divorcement. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, you know, there is a, a reason that Moses gives 
men to divorce their wife. But what is not, according to the lesson, what was uh, the, the reason why this bill of divorcement was given was to protect women and their rights. You know, if women, if a woman back then didn't have a bill of divorcement and they were seeking to find another spouse, uh, uh, the, the men during those days would try to uh, stone her or, or accuse her of committing adultery, which is why a bill of divorcement was given to a woman to protect her rights. Jesus doesn't go into detail about this because he wants them to be pointed back to creation and how the original uh, marriage, the plan for marriage was supposed to be, man and woman. And he really emphasized, he really emphasized marriage and how it should not be split that easily. Okay, so I want to ask you a question now to, for the audience. Why is Jesus making such a big deal about marriage? What is the meaning behind marriage? Who would like it to answer this question? Uh, marriage is, a, is the first sacred institution. After that comes the Sabbath. And uh, it also reflects another union between Christ and the church. Mm. And so only the true bridegroom can give us a definite answer. And the true bridegroom is Jesus. Amen. And today, of course, uh, we are living in a broken world. Uh, so much of complications. Very hard, uh, you know, cultural influence. Uh, we are not here to judge any individual because God is judge. Mm -hmm. But we always want to encourage people to go back to the word of God. And we thank God in the word of God there is healing as well. There is restoration there is consolation and comfort. So we always go back to the word of God. Amen. Amen. Do we have another comment? Yes, sir. Is it not the hardness of the, their hearts? They put them out? Uh, expand on that. What, what is your question? My question is, is it because the hardness of the heart, the people that doors and things like that, so you're asking, is it because of people's stubbornness and selfishness exactly. that they choose to get a divorce even though it's not biblically sound? Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, to answer that question, I'll, I would think so. But like Pastor Mike was saying, you know, we do live in a sinful world, in a terrible world, so uh, things can be difficult. But if we help navigate different couples to the word of God, we can see how we, that the marriage union needs to be uh, fought for and such forth. You have another hand. And, and I, was, I was looking at the situation where Jesus, I think it's in the book of Luke, where, he re, where the children of Israel rejected him. He did so much. He did so much. And, and he said, your house is left to you desolate. And again, my advice, to I, I give some advice to people. You have to look at yourself where you are spiritually, if that individual is going to cause you to lose your soul, you have to separate yourself from that individual. Mm. And, and, and listening to the teaching in the church, uh, I, there was a guy, uh, excuse me, a young lady who went to the pastor because her husband has given her a black eye. And she went to, to, went to, the, to counsel, you know, get counsel from the pastor and the pastor told her she didn't pray enough. Go mm. home and pray more. And she came back with another black eye. Oh, man. Mm. And then she went back to the pastor and said, is that good enough for you? Mm. You see, so, again, we, our, our relationship is really built in Christ, mm. like, like Pastor Michael says. You have to connect with Christ. And he'll talk to you. He'll talk to you. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, the key word is the relationship. God created man and woman to have that relationship, the bond, the faithfulness, and uh, all those things, showing us the relationship with Christ and his church. Mm, yes, that's it. That's the reason God created the marriage. By the way, man fails because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No matter what kind of sin God is willing to forgive if we confess and ask for forgiveness. Because being married 
And if you do not have relationship with Christ, it doesn't give a ticket to heaven. You can be faithful in being married, but they don't have Christ That's in it. them. Right. We have room for one more hand before I move on to the next question. Yes. Marriage should be like a triangle, you know, the husband and wife, and with God in the center. Right. And that will be, you know, perfect for a healthy marriage. That, that, that's a nice segue to actually my next question today. Um, Excuse me. Sure, sure, go on ahead. I also want to say you should have commitment. Commitment. You should keep the commitment. Yes. Yeah, yes. And the marriage will be fine. Thank you. Thank you. Before that, you, you actually, your question might not even answer my next question that I'm going to ask, your, your comment. I know this weekend is marriage and family weekend, right? So I'm glad, I know we're going to learn a lot of lessons to help strengthen our marriages. But based on the knowledge that we already shared some, based on the wisdom that we have acquired, I'm sure all of you have been married for quite some time. And, you know, I'm looking to get married soon by God's grace. So what, what are ways we can strengthen marriages today? I, I think the most important thing is to love. It's not enough to read your Bible. I mean, spend a lot of time in prayer and reading your word because the word changes you. And, and just like how Christ loved the church, mm -hmm. just like the way how Christ loved the children of Israel, the husband should love their wives. Mm. And, and the wives should respect their husbands respect. no matter what. You know, marriage is, uh, doesn't bring you happiness. It makes you holy for heaven. Hmm. It's, a, it's a pathway to heaven. Hmm. So, you know, you do not know what's wrong with you. Your part, some, the person that you're marrying is coming from a different background, from different walk of life. And he sees in you the defects that you do not see, your family doesn't see. So God, and, and of course, God brings you all together for a reason, because you are the only person that can help that person come to heaven. You know exactly what's mm. wrong. And um, I've, I've seen, and I've, I've seen with my own eyes, like you pray for like 30 years, and then you see a change in a marriage, and I praise God for that. Amen. When the wife just sticks to the husband no matter what, mm. God is good. So I heard from that response, genuine love and your care for your spouse is the best way to strengthen relationships. Yes, we have one more comment. You want to repeat that, repeat that for those online? I was saying communication is very important in mm. a marriage. You know, the husband and wife should spend time together communicating and talking things over. Mm, that's good. That's good. Amen. Amen. Yeah, uh, with that being said, uh, I'm sure we'll learn a lot more, like I said, during this weekend on how we can better strengthen marriages and such forth. Okay, let's move on to Monday's portion. Uh, yeah, Monday's portion titled Jesus and Children. And this is going to be found in Mark chapter 10, 13 to 16. We can see here how Jesus is practically pro-family. After getting the subject now of marriage, now we go on to see the subject of children. And what do we see here in verse 13 to 16? How uh, they brought, uh, we see mothers or fathers bringing young children to Jesus, and the disciples rebuked them that brought them, thinking that children were just a waste of time. But when Jesus saw this, in verse 14, he was much displeased. Some translations say he was very indignant. He was angry, and he tells them, No, do not stop the children from coming to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. For whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he will not enter therein. And he took the children, and he blessed them. In those days, children were viewed very lowly. Yes, they were loved very much, but when we look at it from a social status, they were similar, to, similar to as slaves, which is why the disciples thought it was absolutely ridiculous for Jesus to waste his time on children. But Jesus rebukes them, and he says that the kingdom of God should be received like a child. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does it mean to receive a child like, uh, to receive the kingdom of heaven like a child? Children, children believe, uh, if you tell them a, a story, they believe as it is. When you are grown up, like, you apply logic. That, that childlike trust, right? Yeah, that implicit exactly. trust. 
right? I heard, I heard another innocent. They're innocent. You know, uh, the children are innocent. They just, child, they just trust. When parents tell their children things, they believe it. You know, I don't have any children, but I remember my brother, he's 10 years younger than I am. And whatever I told this guy, he believed it. You know, I told so much. I was a bad older brother. I told him I was a hit man. I told him all these different things. He believed it. Why? Because I was someone of authority. You know, I was someone he looked up to. And the same way we're supposed to be like these children, when Jesus says something, we're supposed to just accept it as it is and believe it wholeheartedly, for he is good. He is good. And there's actually another lesson to be learned from this account as well. And there's this hilarious quote from Ellen White, well, you might not find it funny. Uh, Ministry of Healing, page 43 to 44, this is what she says. And this is taken from the lesson. Let not your unlike child, your unchristlike character misrepresent Jesus. Do not keep the little ones away from him by your coldness and harshness. Never give them cause to feel that heaven would not be a pleasant place to them if you were there. Did you catch that? When you are around children or other children, do not act or behave in a way that if, they, if you happen to be in heaven with them, they'll look at you and be like, man, what are you doing here? Isn't that hilarious? And this is such a big deal because... Um, along that same line, it says, do not speak of religion as something that children cannot understand or act as if they were not expected to accept Christ in their childhood. Do not give them the false impression that the religion of Christ is a religion of gloom. And in coming to the Savior, they must give all the, that makes life joyful. You know, as a, as a denomination, as a church, you know, we have we are guilty of representing of making the representing the gospel in such a bad light. And now there's such a big crisis and dilemma in North America where just children and the youth don't want to come to church anymore. And one alarming statistic is uh, taken from a recent study is that 50% of Seventh-day Adventist teenagers in North America leave the church by their 20s. 50% of teenagers, by the time they get to their 20s, they're not in church anymore. That is crazy. And another statistic, the average age in North America is 38 years old, right? That's the median age. Do you know what the average age of Seventh-day Adventists in North America is? Close, 61. 61. That's pretty, that's pretty down, you know, up there. You know, where is the youth? You know, what's, are we representing the gospel in a way that will make it attractive to children? You know, yes, it's so important to, prove, to preach present truth about the coming last days, the Sunday law. Um, I see a hand. And I, I want to I wanna, uh, ask this question. Then we'll take uh, some hands here. What are some ways we can present the gospel to children that will make them like church and stay in the future? Uh, Uncle, I know you, you, you had your hand first. Uh, there's a question. Uh, there's a comment question online. Oh, oh, oh sure. Uh, what and, is it? And uh, young people leave the church because Christians and church uses the doctrines to judge them directly, and uh, we don't accept them where they are, and then let them hear the word uh, because we judge them, and we are playing Pharisees in the church. And a lot of Christians are doing that, and we see it around us. So, okay, so that, that person's comment was saying because of the judgmental uh, characteristic of the church, young people are leaving. Okay, so what are some ways that we could present the gospel to children that will make them like church and to stay in the future? Yes, you had it, yes. I, I think um, we kind of conflate certain things about what you think or what they don't think, and I've been in this church now 30 years, been a Sabbath school teacher for half, half of those years. And it's not about, it's we don't deal with present problems with present truth. Hmm. That's what present truth is about. And we have a world with a bunch of problems that we then, the, when we say we, the world looks to government to fix when God gave us solutions to those problems. Hmm. But we sit back and we're not engaged in our communities 
to provide solutions. So of course, our, our faith and our, our, our belief system doesn't seem effective because we're not out there trying to solve problems and people then only believe they only can get it done by government. And that's why government then takes over all of our environments mm. our, in, in, in our homes, in our bedrooms, right? Because the government is saying, you aren't doing it, people, in your so-called mm -hmm. religious organizations. So somebody has to do it. So it's, it's, it's making the gospel present truth dealing with present problems relevant. And we, don't, we still live and talk decades away as if this was still in the time of the Lord. It's like, no, let's make it real time to deal with those real solutions. Problems. Yeah, that's very interesting. Okay, so you're saying instead of letting the government handle the present problems that uh, the youth face today, why don't we as a church address them? That's a good, that's a good take. Yes, we have another hand here. Oh, we had one back here first. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say the reason why the, the, by the time the kids hit 20, they end up leaving and go into the streets or do whatever is because we, as a church body, we fail the kids. We only see them on Sabbath. What happened to the rest of the six days? And the world, they, they with them, social media 24-7. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. Yes. Uh, Moenko, did you have yes, your yes, hand up? Yes. yes. Uh, what... Uh, and it mentioned about the question that uh, I would say in the denomination, in our church, even in here, no exception, uh, we try to act, pretend. In other words, acting is hypocrisy. Hmm. If you are a husband, you cannot claim that now if anybody is a husband, you cannot, it's a holy word. You cannot call yourself a husband unless you are like Jesus. Forget about that. You have no right unless we follow Jesus. So also in this church, if we talk about others, low or bad, and at that time I'm mm -hmm. saying, I'm better than you. Bible says, consider others better than yourself. I need to understand, humble myself, and then uh, uh, make sure that I don't be a fall away. People watch, children watch. Mm -hmm. Whether we tell the truth, stand for the truth, I, or am I a hypocrite? hypocrite. Mm, that's, that's At true. church, I might be somebody else <laughs> doing all sorts of things, but I may not be. I might be too far from heaven. Children watch. That's one of the reasons judging. We should stop that nonsense, you know. It, it's not, I'm sad to say, because we are getting ready to go to heaven. Unless we get rid of all these things, we are not ready to heaven. It is just hypocrisy. And how can I tell my children? It's nonsense. That's, That's why children point. leave the church. That's a good point. Let's take one more hand. Here. Just yes, uh, one quick comment. Uh, online, it was posted about doctrines. Now, doctrines without Christ can drive people away. Mm. But doctrines with Christ draws Raise people. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, there's one comment here, and then we'll go to Jacob. Um, good morning, church family. You know, having worked with youth for many, many, many years, um, which I thank God for having that privilege of being able to work with young people, one of the fundamental things that young people want when they are in church is they want to be able to express themselves in a way where they can be heard, uh, they can be understood, but they want it to be in a safe space, okay? And that's one of the things that mm -hmm. Uh, God taught me was to create a safe space for young people to where they could express themselves. They could be involved in ministry. They could say, you know, certain things. They could do certain things without them feeling as if they were being alienated. And many times our worship services are for old people. That's how they're structured. You know, they're structured for everybody who's 61 and up. <laughs> okay? um, it, it is not designed to incorporate the youth as it should be. And so the youth feel like, okay, we get our little lesson up front, we get a youth Sabbath every once in a while, right? And, and all the church members, you know, we say amen, and we're so happy to see our young people up there. In other words, it's a novelty when it should be something that happens every week. And the kids feel like 
they are almost like a circus act. We put them up front, we say, oh, you did a wonderful job. <laughs> and then we'll visit you in three months from now and you do the same thing. Well, they're, they're, they're not a circus act, they're part of us, they're an extension of us. And we should treat them as such. And so I believe one of the reasons why young people leave is because they, they see that they're not valued as everybody else is valued, because they can't pay tithe yet, so they're not valued like the adults. And so I think we need to be more mindful of how intelligent young They are super, super smart. And I think we need to incorporate them more into our worship services. We need to utilize their skills more as, or as much as we possibly can and even get more feedback from them as it relates to the scriptures and understanding these things, but spend time with them, teach them, share with them so that they can become more educated, more educated in the things of God and not just kind of leave them to themselves or find ways to, you know, kind of have a spiritual daycare. And I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you for sharing. Let's take... They, they all worship together. They all walk together. They didn't say, oh, the children are small. We, they cannot uh, worship with us. Even when they came, when you watch the Jewish, uh, see them in the synagogues, the children came. They were supposed to memorize the whole Pentateuch, right? By the time they were 12 and 13, they were supposed to know God. But our children know social media more than God. Yes. Hello. Yes. Um, I agree with all the prior comments. And um, I was once young and now I'm older. And the Bible says, train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they shall not depart from it. I grew up in, for about 12 years with my grandparents. And they taught me to love God. And... Then when I lived with my parents, they didn't practice Christ in the household. Mm -hmm. It was just a secular household. But at 13, 12, 13 years old, because that love was inspired in me as a child, I made the choice to go to church on my own to continue to spend time in God's word. And so... I think it's a choice as a person gets older whether or not they want to continue to follow Christ with, and there are, of course, influences in the world. So um, each of us, you know, were children and we do have a choice to make as we get older. Mm, right on. I'm going to let Mr. Jacob, you have the final word and we got to move on here. I'm hearing a few comments that are kind of what I was going to say, but it starts out in the family. If you're having family worship and so mm. on, um, and if you're having family worship and church cancels one Sabbath because of snow, you're not missing the world because you're going on, you're, you're, you're continuing. Um, and I know in some families you don't have that, but when the church is trying to substitute that, and I've seen over the last 30 years in churches where they're, they're bringing in things to make it attractive to children, and now we have the highest rates of children leaving the church because they grow up and they say, well, hey, there's no difference between church and the world. So I might as well be in the world. Hmm. So that's not going to work. And, and I know we get less and less children, so we say, okay, well, we need to have more, bring in the music they like, bring in the drums, bring in the rock and roll. Let's, let's, you know, let's dress down and let's change our diet. It doesn't work. Amen. As we lower the standard, as a rule, we fall short of the standard. So as the standard gets lower and lower, we can't make up man-made standards. It has to start in the home. The parents have to. But what about people that come in, they don't have that in the home? Well, that's a different issue that we can discuss, but the church Sabbath school, mm. we have the thing. And again, the Sabbath school can't be a worldly Sabbath school. We have to bring them to the world. And I've seen results in my teaching. I've seen results in others where when we follow this, when the statement, you know, don't make, don't make it as though they don't want to be in heaven if you're there. We have to be loving. As teachers, you have to be there to their needs and help them as one that cares for them. So if they're not getting that in the home, 
they're seeing that in the church, and then they want to be in church because they see that. So changing the standard, putting man-made standards is not the answer. We have to be, we have to go back to the Lord, say, Lord, what is it that you have? Um, and we're going to see a greater reform because we're told in the end it's going to be the children that are going to rise up and that are going to be preaching this truth. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. Um, one thing I would say just on that, I know people have so much to say. Thank you for everyone for your contribution. But one thing I would say um, to my future children, by God's grace, and to the other youth is I would make sure that they have a relationship with Christ. You know, that truly is the most important thing. Because I'm only standing here because of Jesus. You know, it's because he intervened in my life I'm standing up here. I wouldn't be here. If I'm being honest, if I never had a relationship with Jesus, I wouldn't be here. I'm 25. Church, why would I want to go to church, right? But if we teach the youth the, the importance of a relationship with them, that he truly does care about us and he genuinely loves us, then I'm sure that would give them more initiative and motivation to stay and such forth. With that being said, let's go ahead and move to Tuesday's portion. We're not going to be able to cover all the lesson, but it's okay. You know, we had a good conversation. Amen. But let's keep on going here. Tuesday is the best investment. All right. And this is Mark 10, 17 to 31. And right here, we come across the rich young ruler. Right? The rich young ruler, he goes to Jesus. And he says, uh, Master, what can I do to inherit, inherit eternal life? Um, Jesus says, "You, uh, what are the commandments? Have you been keeping them? And he says, I've been keeping them from my youth. And then Jesus, one thing that you lack, go and sell all that you have. But the rich young ruler could not do so, and he went away sorrow, for he had great possessions. You know, he's one of the few people that to enter into Jesus' presence and to leave more sorrowful than what he was before. Right? He left more sad than when he first came to Jesus. And it's very interesting to note here that when, um, when Jesus shares the commandments, right, he talks about the second half, uh, God's uh, man's duty to man. But let me ask the question first. What commandment was this man breaking? He said he was keeping all of them from his youth, but truly what commandment was this man breaking? The first step. The first, thou shalt have no other gods before me. What else? Number 10, thou shalt not covet, right? This young man coveted the things of this world. He loved his riches, and he was not able to, you know, get, uh, put that laid at the feet of Jesus, which is why it's so interesting. If you look at verse 19, he says, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, which is, you know, false witness, and honor thy father, thy mother. Which one was he forgetting? The tenth one, thou shalt not covet, because he knew this is the one that he needed to work on. And with that being said, the rich young ruler really thought that it was his acts of obedience that would save him. And truly, it was not working out for him, right? Which is why he came to Jesus on his knees saying, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So another question, is legalism good or bad? Yes. Don't stone me. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> and of course, I'm going to say that we are law-abiding citizens. And we have to be law-abiding citizens in the new kingdom. Right. So there's nothing wrong with legalism. It's the fact that you believe your works of being obedient to God is doing something for you. So we have to be, we, have, we cannot be, teach as a community of believers that we are they who keep the commandments of God and don't believe in legalism because the law of God is what we say we practice. The problem is hypocrisy. Hmm. So I want to just say that there's nothing wrong with legalism. The problem mm -hmm. is faith by believing your works is doing something for you. Point mm -hmm. of clarity, self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. Okay, okay. And yes, what bro. motivates your obedience matters. Uh-huh. Just about to say, Cliff, take that ism, then it is good. Wait, wait, say that again? Legalism. We make it complicated. Take it away. That ism, you know, there's a meaning <laughs> there. Then it's good. 
we come to church, we follow the traffic rules and all. Is it legalism? No. You follow God. That's not legalism. Interesting. But the ism of Adventism we keep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one more hand. I think the rich young ruler had a genuine uh, need. He wanted to know what he lacked. And that should be our concern too. Every morning when we get up, we should ask, Lord, what do I lack? Where do I lack? I mean, we also have other gods. He, for him, it was his riches. Mm. For us, we should look and see, when you get in, if you are depressed or you are in a panic mode, what do you go to immediately? Mm. You know? It's, so that is your God. Mm. So my prayer is that we look in, into our own hearts and like that rich young ruler and find out what is wrong with me, us Deep. individually and also know where our weak points are. That's true. Amen. And uh, many times the rich young ruler is better than many of us because at least he went to Jesus. Mm. We don't even go. Mm. I want to pose another interesting question. Yes, go ahead, Sushil uh, I'm going to pose this question, then I'm going to ask you to share your comment. Yeah. True or false, can a, a, a commandment-keeping Christian can go to hell? Can a commandment-keeping Christian go to hell? Yes. Let's say, uh, yes, what is your comment no, or question? I mean, my prior, the prior question was, we should not keep things as a barrier between us and God. You know, the rich man, he did not want to get rid of any of his uh, riches. So it should not be a barrier. Make sure to have no barriers. Yes. No, you cannot go to hell if you keep the commandments. That's and, right. Amen. And why I say that is because the Jews that were, that were planning to kill Jesus were not keeping the Sabbath. That's right. And you cannot truly keep the Sabbath if your heart is not in it. Amen. You can outwardly keep it. But remember Jesus said your, your righteousness has to be more than the Pharisees. They were taking their plants and they took 10%. And Jesus said, this you ought to do, but not to leave the others undone. Amen. So... If you tell your son, okay, take the garbage out, and he takes it out begrudgingly, he's not obeying you. Mm. And so I know what you're saying. You can go to church and go to hell, no question about it. You can, be, you can be high up in the general conference. You can be preaching all the time. You can be giving all your tithes and you go to hell. There's no question about mm. that. But if you're, if you're keeping the commandments, it has to be in your heart. Because remember the, the sanctuary. In the heart of the most holy place was the Ten Commandments. Mm. And in the last sanctuary, it wasn't there. They mm. replaced it with a rock. And so the Shekinah glory didn't shine forth in there. And in the end, arise, shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. That glory has to be seen in us, which only comes by keeping the law in our heart. And that's what it says. A new commandment is what? That your law is written in the heart. So it mm. has to be in the heart, but... I know the intent of the question, but yes. <laughs> so that's, that's a really good point. So you're saying if, if Christians are genuinely keeping it, right, not just superficially keeping the commandments, but if they're genuinely keeping it out of a place of love and sincerity for Christ, yeah, they're not going to be going to hell. Yeah, not like the Pharisees, but like Christ. But exactly. Amen. Amen. And, you know, if we go along Mark chapter 17 after that incident, and now uh, uh, the, the, Jesus gets into a discussion about riches and how it's easier for a camel to go into the eye and needle for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God and they were all astonished and then Jesus says with man it may seem impossible but with God all things are possible now here we have Peter Peter says Jesus and you know this is after three years now of the, G of the Peter and the disciples spending time with Jesus leaving their homes and everything to serve with him he says he says, you know, we have left all. We have left all and followed thee. And Jesus assures him that, listen, because you have left all, because you have done all these sacrifices for me that you will receive, or anyone for that matter, will receive a hundredfold in the next life, in the world to come. And I just want that to be a sense of assurance for us that if we truly live our lives completely devoted for the sake of Christ, 100% living for him, we will be rewarded hundredfold. Maybe not in this life, 
but definitely in the next. And it's so crazy. It's so crazy. You know, the key text is Mark chapter 10, verse 45. I'm going to read that. Mark 10, 45. For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life for a ransom for many. You know, it's so crazy. You know, people work their whole lives um, so hard. And all in, you know, nothing wrong with that. Working their whole lives, gaining a fortune from the same, gaining success, uh, money. But at the end of the day, all those things they are acquired, acquired is temporary. And the next life, it's going to mean nothing. So that should really, truly inspire each and every single one of us to work for something which is eternal. And I'm not sure what blessings are in store for us heaven when Jesus says, you will be rewarded according to your works. I'm not exactly sure what he has in store for us, but that should excite us, knowing that what is in store for us is eternal. Amen. Amen. As we come to a close here, I want to thank each and every single one of us, uh, one of you guys, for a wonderful conversation. I just have some closing remarks I would like to share. Uh, let me see right here. Like mentioned before, Mark 10 is the leading up to Jesus' final crisis. In the same way, the principles that are taught, taught in Mark chapter 10 should be lessons that we need to be un uh, understanding of before the upcoming crisis, the Sunday law crisis. And uh, we need to be making sure that our families are straight Marriages are strong, and then children are well-trained and equipped. We have to be making sure that we're keeping the commandments of God, not from obligation, but out of sincerity for the love of Christ. We have to be making sure that we're striving to serve others, because if we are selfish during these last days, we will be miserable. If we are not living a life of service, there is no point of us living. Bold, bold statement right there and then. All right. We have to be making sure that we have, finally, we have to be making sure that we have implicit faith and trust in God. It is my sincere desire that all of us took at least one thing from today's lesson and let us all strive facing the challenges of life, knowing that if we do so, we will be blessed. Amen and thank you. Let's pray. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, so much for this beautiful lesson that you have given us, Lord. Thank you, for, thank you, Lord, for the contribution of every single uh, participant here. We pray that we continue to strive to serve you uh, faithfully in spirit and in truth. Please continue to work on our hearts, Lord. If there's anything in our hearts that we're willing to give up, if there's things that we're holding on to, Lord, we pray that you help us to relieve those things, Lord, and to let it go and leave it at your feet, Lord. Country to be with each and every single one of us. Give us a heart to serve. Be with us now as we enter into the divine service. Fill us more with your Holy Spirit. Change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.